Joining us is defence analyst Helmut Roma Heitman. Very good afternoon. Appreciate your time this uh, this afternoon. Now, talk to us firstly, I suppose, about the the cost of sending uh, the SANDF to to protect uh, these uh, ESCOM power plants and. A lot of this uh, apparently is based on some intelligence around uh, potential sabotage. How much do we know about that? Look, nothing really is in the public domain. Um, but obviously, it's, there was some sort of intelligence input. Otherwise, they wouldn't have decided to deploy troops. Without knowing what the, the expected threat is, it's difficult to judge you know, how effective this will be. What, what is obvious, though, is that I mean, 10 soldiers, a, a, a large installation like a power station, aren't going to make a hell of a lot of difference. Um, all they can really do is, is one of two things. They can either beef up ESCOM's own security at the gate, or they can man observation posts on, on top of one of the buildings, say, to monitor the perimeter, and then call in a reaction force if something happens. The, it's either adding muscle at the gate, or they were expecting some sort of physical attack on the station. Um, the third option would be that it's a gesture to say, listen, we're being serious about this now, which is also possible um, you know, to make the point and discourage people trying things. But obviously a soldier is no good at judging if it's internal sabotage or if the cold being delivered is the right quality that a soldier can do. Well, we understand that the operation is called Operation Prosper. Do we know what the terms of deployment are? Look, that's, that's the whole support of the civil authority stuff. That's the same thing when they, for instance, when, when many hospital staff have gone on strike, employed medical, uh, military health service people to support the nursing staff that were still there, and some soldiers to protect them and guard the hospitals. It all falls under maintenance of essential services. Um, but the actual specific uh, rules of engagement mandate, that will, of course, vary from case to case. And I haven't seen anything to say what, what it is in this case. Now, obviously, you're, you're a defense analyst. Uh, so let's talk about having, I mean, as you say, 10 soldiers, let's, let's break it down uh, in your assumption. What are these soldiers going to, to be actually doing? How much uh, information do they know about the running of power plants? How will they determine that uh, person A should not be in this particular position? Will they actually be able to identify if uh, a perpetrator of sorts was in a place they, they shouldn't? Look, no, they, they, have to, like, they will have to rely on, on ESCOM security personnel and support them. If they obviously don't know that stuff, I mean, they're not engineers. They don't know how a power station works any more than I do. Um, they also won't do zoo in the zoo, but they can provide the muscle at, at, the, at the security checkpoints. And I said they could, for instance, at night, provide, uh, set up an OP with night vision equipment to see if somebody's trying to slip his way through the perimeter to come in and do something he shouldn't. That they can do. Well, Helmut, one of the things that you've, uh, that you've said is that the SNDF really has no uh, reason to, to be there, uh, if, if you will, potentially not much value being added. In, in your mind, what needs to be done to deal with the challenges that ESCOM is facing at these power plants? Well, primarily, it's, it's a case of getting a group of people that are physically working for ESCOM and corruption in the companies that supply ESCOM. And now, that needs a proper investigation. I think they have started that sort of investigation. And then they will have to weed people out uh, within the company. The problem there is that the unions will probably get in the way until they can really prove conclusively somebody was the return. Um, where the military comes in, obviously, would be just as an interim solution to make the point that they're serious to, to help with physical security. But what they need to do is to sort out their own internal security and the investigation capability. So that, that would suggest that at this juncture, ESCOM are sort of a... In a, in a position where they don't really know how, how to deal with the, with the challenges. And the first port of call for them was to call in the SANDF to offer some form of uh, support or send a message. If they are sending a message by engaging the SN, SANDF, what would that message be? Well, look, I mean, first of all, yes, you're right. The government turns to the military every time something goes wrong. And they underfund them. They laugh at them. They don't provide them the equipment they need. They don't give them the money to maintain equipment and train properly. But every time something goes wrong, they call them in which is being silly at best. Um, the message, I suppose, is really just, you know, we're going to get serious about this. You know, the impression of a soldier is the first thing you'll do is shoot, which is entirely true, but that's an impression people have. So I think that's, that's probably the, the message they're intending to put across, is we are now serious. We're not going to tolerate any nonsense. How, how well it will be received remains to be seen. 
Homer Roma Heitman, who is a defense analyst, speaking to us about the allocation of SNDF uh, troops to a number of uh, ESCOM facilities. So